Let's do the parallel plate waveguide again, but this time with something we haven't seen before in free space. We'll look for a TE solution, where the E field is transverse, but the B field isn't. For the TEM solution, we started with a plane wave, with the E field polarized in the J hat direction. To get something new, and perhaps richer, we'll take that template and add and or change some degrees of freedom. Put another way, our general method here, and in many other places, is to use any trial function you please, and constrain it with Maxwell equations and boundary conditions. Whatever survives those constraints is a solution. So we're looking for a TE mode, meaning we need E in the I hat or J hat directions. We did J hat before, so let's try I hat to bring the boundary conditions into play in a different way. Let's also add some spatial dependence in the form of a Y dependent amplitude. Notice that this is set up as a product solution, which is never a bad idea. So E equals E of Y times E to the I K Z minus omega T I hat. We can get the form of B from Faraday's law, and in the process ensure that our solutions satisfy that Maxwell equation. Del cross E equals minus dB to T, and the latter will be minus I omega B. Taking the curl of our E yields two non-zero terms, and dividing through by I omega gives us B equals K over omega E Y J hat, plus I E prime Y over omega K hat, where the prime means derivative with respect to Y all times that propagating exponential. Now before we move on, I want you to stop the video for a moment and think about how to interpret the fact that one of the B terms is real and the other is imaginary. When you've got an idea you're happy with, move on. Okay, let's review what this complex exponential representation means. E to the I K Z minus omega T equals cos K Z minus omega T plus I sine K Z minus omega T. And in the end, we take the real part of everything, and the real of that gives us cos kz minus omega t. But had the exponential been multiplied by an i, the real part would have been minus sine. And so on the previous slide, the i assigned to one of the terms means that the actual physical b field has a j hat term proportional to cos and a k hat term proportional to sine. They're out of phase with one another. Okay, so we've got functional forms for e and b we need to fix that E of Y function. Let's invoke the Ampere-Maxwell equation and see what happens. Del cross B equals one over C squared DE dt, and the time derivative brings down a factor of I omega from the exponential. We can write out the curl of B in Cartesian and see that most of the terms are zero, either because the function doesn't depend on X at all, or because the B field doesn't have a component in the X direction. The terms that remain evaluate something like this, which when set equal to one over c squared de dt gives us the following. E double prime equals minus omega squared over c squared minus k squared times e. And that's a simple harmonic oscillator equation. And the solution is a linear combination of sines and cosines, with frequency nu given by the square root of omega squared over c squared minus k squared. Now here's a tricky part. We've introduced this nu and related it to omega and k, but we haven't solved for it per se. To do that, we'll use some boundary conditions. We know that E parallel has to be continuous at Y equals zero and Y equals B, and E equals zero inside the conductor, so our E of Y function must be zero at zero and B. Check out the E of zero condition. Y being zero makes the sine term automatically zero and the cos term one, so to force that to be pure zero, we must have C2 equal to zero. Then check out the E of B condition. We must have sine of nu b equals zero, which works if nu is equal to n pi over b for any integer n. And that means that root omega squared over c squared minus k squared equals n pi over b. It's a more complex dispersion relation than we've had before, which will lead to some interesting wave speed behavior, which we'll consider in detail in the next lesson. We're also seeing a number of different solutions indexed by the integer n, meaning there are many TE modes. Oftentimes we need to refer to a specific one with notation like TE of n or TE sub n. Putting it all together, TE modes can exist in this parallel plate waveguide with an E field that looks like E naught sine n pi y over b times E to the i k z minus omega t all in the i hat direction, with b given by k E naught over omega sine n pi y over b j hat plus 
i n pi e naught over b omega times cos n pi y over b k hat, all times the exponential. Notice that part of the b field is transverse to the direction of propagation, and part of it is parallel to the direction of propagation, something that can't happen in free space. There's one last consideration, and that's the possibility of induced surface charges or currents in the waveguide boundaries. Our E is in the i-hat direction, meaning the component of E perpendicular to those boundaries is always zero, so there won't be any induced surface charge. There is a component of B parallel to those boundaries, so there will be a non-zero surface current. And here we take a look at the basics of a TE mode, in particular the TE1 mode. The E field is fairly vanilla, oscillating back and forth down the middle of the waveguide and tapering off in strength as we get to the boundary. The B field has a more complicated shape, forming little rings that march down the axis. You might guess that this is going to lead to a pointing vector, and therefore energy transport, that has a lot going on. You'd be right. This production of Physics 462 has been brought to you by the letter upside down triangle, and by the number N.